Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Lithuania between the 13th and the 14th century, which is a very interesting case of expansion and decline, let's say, of this um, uh, confederation of uh, Baltic tribes evolving to essentially duchies and the Grand Duchy of the Lithuania, as it's called eventually also uh, for further institutional development, all the, the union with Poland that we'll see another in fact we we'll stop today with that um is um is reflecting uh, this um this un fundamentally unstable uh, lithuanian reality that however was marked by a significant level of militarization right that allowed during the 13th century especially and for also during the 14th the, the, first of all the expansion but all, and, and the consolidation in the process through raiding uh, to looting, etc., and therefore accumulating of wealth, etc., uh, and uh, eventually also, you know, survival from the neighboring uh, attacks. Uh, as we will see, Lithuania was fundamentally, if not under siege, however, under constant threat, especially from the northwest and towards the, the latter period, treated today also by by Moscow, and we'll see all the connections here we're also talking about a uh, a wide area that doesn't quite just encompass Lithuania that uh, can you know more or less overlap with the you know the, the territory of today's country but overwhelmingly like uh, like one to ten like you know uh, one to nine say better um, the territory of Rutenia right in the south uh towards uh into fundamentally today it would be today's russia and part of the, the, the ukraine further south lithuanians arrived up to kiev at some point as we will see uh to rule exploiting the gap for the instability formed after the destruction of the kievan Rus, effectively at the hands of the mongols we will observe partly this co dominion that allowed the lithuanians essentially to live off of that territory in order to survive against the uh, mostly the Teutonic expansion in, in the West, you know that the main, one of the main features, uh, if not properly the main the main exception of Lithuania in this picture, is the fact that it was a pagan country, still very late in time, with practices that we can see as I don't know, for example, burning um, funeral practices of you know the corpses as still as you know for for the, for the dukes, uh, you know, still throughout all this period and actually even further after the formal Christianization. Um, as we addressed somewhere else, because we talked about Lithuania here and there, but I think th this is the first specific basic video we make. We made a video also on the Silk Institutus as a beautiful example of a um, 14th century um, Lithuanian panoply with Western and Eastern, let's say, European uh, features in armor uh, and arms and uh, fascinating. Um, we will keep talking about Lithuanian war for some point, right, because there is really a lot to say, and that they were effectively about war, right, they were warlike tribes that mm, press, uh, pressured by Metis Hostilis, acquired political cohesion, and um, and developed the, their military uh, ac accordingly, right, exploiting the, essentially the weakness, the instability of, of this broader, mostly Eastern European reality that was going through a very severe distress, especially as we were saying before, after the Mongol invasion, the Golden Horde, and so on. Um, one of, you know, th there are a few sources actually about uh, Lithuania, as where, you know, some parts of the area, there are also here interesting polities, not just the Russian principalities, but let's say that sometimes we rely on a couple of, of chronicles to, to know in detail, but some of these offered the interesting uh, list of the, mm, ec you know, mm, ex uh, foreign military ex excursions of the Lithuanians uh, uh, at this point, right, as the Baltic tribes essentially coordinating to uh, join and launching uh, raids to loot in the surrounding lands. And they were quite uh, insistent, were quite frequent, which speaks for essentially a semi-professional uh, altogether you know kind of military character of these people and naturally with a essentially a professional elite that by approximation also in the tribal world kind of is but that here was naturally resenting also the influences from uh, from first of all the, the enemies that were fighting right that there is hardly any more powerful cultural hybridizer than war so the Teutonic Knights that were basically the, the best that Europe could offer uh, at that point 
And we see here, for example, 40, 40 such expeditions between 1201 and 1236, which means more than one a year. Here we are, you know, like the best current days of the Carolingians, in a sense. Um, uh, let's, of course, understand that Eastern Europe had somewhat lag behind in terms of uh, broader political and social consolidations, was much more unstable reality. The military structures were less developed. So it's remarkable to see such a, an activity uh, so intense, which was actually normal in terms of, uh, you know, how tribal realities are that is perennially unstable and needing to 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 essentially go out there and raid some the, the neighbors lands in order to to even survive in the first place but here we are seeing you know something greater something more organized right it's not just the usual raiding you know uh, war at the frontier of a of a chieftain's you know uh, possessions right these are coordinated efforts of this uh, of the region that contributed to define properly what also modern Lithuania fundamentally is, aside from the ethnic divisions that surely existed. Um, I don't know, the, the Lithuanians had, they were thought to have distinguished from the Latvians from, you know, the 7th century. They had very, um, let's say, uh, archaic, like kind of traditionalist uh, legacy, properly also in language, in that they had, as you know, a culture on their own. These are Baltic languages that fundamentally do not have a, a clear, you know, uh, affiliation to any, like, nor to the Germanic, nor to the, uh, to the Slavic ones. So they are properly something on their own, and retaining, as you will see, because of this political picture we have enucleated, also further their own traditional ideas like about paganism etc not because they you know the, this land was particularly different from the others that had the were christianizing or had already christianized but because their enemies were i don't know the crusaders <laughs> for example and and um as you will see there were also other territorial aims that naturally uh, wouldn't uh, from from catholic powers and uh, also orthodox ones but um in fact as you know lithuania would swing uh, dramatic you know, the, the the union with Poland was not to be given for granted. Lithuania at some point had already um, actually signed a matrimonial alliance with with, with mm, the Moscovy at some point. Right, could have had the Commonwealth of uh, Moscow Lithuania at some point rather than Poland Lithuania. Things went differently, but they could evolve in different ways. The, the point though I was making is that um, it was most a pragmatic pragmatical. You know, realization and or yes the, the, the also christianization entails the necessity of a specific local territorial kind of infrastructural administration etc that lithuania may have you know um, developed in the meanwhile compared to other countries who were christianized but let's say that it was primarily as far as i understand in terms of balance altogether because of the specific enemies they were facing so much that the lithuanians were actually entertaining uh, relations with the papacy, uh, you know, and not with the Holy Roman Empire. It was mediating actually the uh, the, the 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 Baltic Crusades of the of the uh, Teutonic Knights and so on. So that is important because not just eventually the Lithuanians would uh, would would uh, Christianize, but eventually they, uh, but especially because they. Um, they they had managed to pursue an independent international policy, which is the most important thing here. And um, in fact, um, you know, at, at this point, the the main areas that were targeted by Lithuanian raids were Ruthenia, Poland, Latvia, Estonia, etc. And also, um, the um, you know, they, they were essentially fencing off the, the the attacks from the Livonian Order, that was a, a branch of the uh, Teutonic. Uh, also surrounding like here you understand the regional dimension here we put several maps uh, they for they, they entered Russia at some levels uh, Pskov for example was pillaged and burned in 1213 right and um, in uh, here let's say that the okay well not, let's not say this but let's say that in, in general Lithuania here was a more of a naturally was a continental power and this area was more towards the interland and, and its Russian neighbors rather than the uh, now the, the Baltic coast was being colonized 
right by the Teutonics in Bayard, in the north also by the Scandinavians, etc. And at some point, they th this went on since the Viking Age, actually, since the, the Denmark had exotic tribes from the Baltic peoples at some point. So they, um, that's all a story that we will have to see. But fundamentally, this was a, a terrestrial power that was essentially out of that kind of high medieval civilization was formed in, in the fashion of feudalism, of cities, of, you know, um, of a church, of ecclesiastical administration, um, uh, an institutionalized professional elite, even of knights, etc. So this is a process that takes gradually, the, the eastern you go, the, 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 the later takes place, fundamentally. But it was also properly not a matter of distance or geographical location, but rather properly of the, the amount of local resources or the politicals and how they were distributed politically uh, and socially among these people. And Pskov, uh, as we've seen, was pillaged and burned in 1213, right? And one of the, you'd say, what, what is observed is one of, one of what maybe the, most imp the, the first most important international recognition of Lithuania like the Lithuanian uh, chieftains here joined in this military, foreign military activity, is the peace treaty signed with the state of Galicia Bolini. Um, and uh, this proves fundamentally the consolidation of this Baltic tribes into something more, more unitary. Than. Now, uh, as we are saying, the, the German crusading military orders were hitting hard the area, in, especially in the 13th century, it was a bit the apex of you know, the medieval, high medieval civilization, the Germans had fully feudalized at this point, so they, they had men and material to, to carry out that extensive systematic colonization and literally, you know, wiping out entire peoples properly from the Baltic, etc., as an ethnic, uh, independent, uh, you know, identities, let's say. And um, they were accompanied also by the, the Livonian brothers of the sword, and they established themselves on the Daugava River, as a major one passing through Riga, and having a, uh, therefore, a capacity in there to, to connect with the interland, important for the traffic and so on. Also in Kelmno, in the Kelmno land. Um, that, as you know, the, the, the Teutons at this point were technically vassals of the Poles, right? The Teutonic Order had been born in the Near East, but was uh, they tried to settle in, in Hungary at some point. They eventually in Poland, and that's where they started their their journey. But as vassals, fundamentally, of of the Polish kingdom, eventually turning to enemies, and you know, eventually also what the world deal of Tannenberg, the Polish Lithuanian Union, was about. Um, and naturally, there was a a religious divide in this because the cru the Crusaders were. The, the Teutons were successfully carrying out uh, Christianization and a stable territorial uh, establishment, fundamentally, of the uh, of, of Christendom in, in those lands, right? In, in the Near East, that would fail, but uh, the, um, the Teutonic Order was uh, a completely different thing in a completely different land, and it was actually one of the most centralized realities and most mo powerful ones at, at the time by medieval standards and uh, systematically as we've seen threatening you know the essentially the, the independence of lands like Latvia Estonia and adding parts of Lithuania that were the that was here also parceled among all these various chieftains as we will see now had troubles even remaining together but for their own personal interests and competitions and naturally uh, there was an, an obvious intertwinement in the intersection of all the various interests of the... There's no simple dichotomy Lithuanians versus the Teutonic Knights, right? They often, as we will see with Min, Min, Daugas himself, support each other against different uh, realities, within, especially within Lithuania. And uh, I named Min, uh, Min Daugas because he was um, this um, essentially Kunigas in Lithuanian, which you understand it's close to Koenig in German, because these are all Indo-European languages, right? Lithuanian is very close to Latin in a certain sense. Uh, I don't know, as Vedic can be. And these were, you know, there are these linguistical parallelisms in this sense also properly. Um, say, German also was, was naturally impacting very much the Baltic linguistically, culturally, because that's that was the prevalent uh, cultural dimension emerging in uh, terms of military, commercial power, etc. 
And um, he was essentially, uh, Cunegas was kind of a major chief among the others, right? One of the five senior dukes listed in the uh, treaty, uh, the aforementioned treaty with, uh, with Galicia Bolinia in 1219, right? So this would be kind of, uh, um, let's say, some, some specific historical areas of Lithuania that were ruled, that were nucleating politically as something on their own, under this chieftain's their own seigniory. And um, for the sake of military coordination, naturally, as always happened, one chief then was chosen to direct, I think, to organize the expedition. Mindaugas was emerging at this point. Um, and uh, various sources, like, for example, the Livonian Rhymed Chronicle, at some point says that by 1236, Mindaugas was um, essentially ruler of all Lithuania, right? This is an approximation, but still it, it, stress, it, it shows how... Uh, a greater centralization among these tribes was emerging under single leaders. Um, and in 1236, same year, the Pope declared a crusade against the Lithuanians. Right? And at this point, the Samogitsians, uh, led by uh, Vin um, Vikintas, that was Mindaugas' rival, uh, crushed in open field the Livonian brothers and their allies at the Battle of Saulen in the same year. Right, this is what forced the brothers of this to to merge with the Teutonic Knights in 1231. Uh, Before I said it was the Livonian order, it was a mistake. But anyhow, um, the the year after, uh, but uh, Lithuania, so the rest of Lithuania, let's say was let's say was trapped between the the two branches of the order. Nevertheless, right, these could be setbacks. But as we will see, um, Lithuania by itself wouldn't never concretely have the capacity to dislodge the, uh, the, the, to, the crusaders from the Baltic lands on their own, right? They mostly carried out a defensive strategy, right, of survival, of, you know, essentially maintain, of maintaining uh, their own territories, but also fencing, mostly fencing off the Teutonic attacks, especially by the 14th century increased, while Lithuania basically couldn't sustain uh, the same rate of military activity anymore. But we'll see it later. And um, uh, around 1240, Min Mindaugas specifically ruled uh, all of the Augstaitia, that is, uh, this, this other historical uh, region of, um, of, of Lithuania. And basically, there are the lands uh, in the upper basin of the Nemunas River. Right. And uh, afterwards, he would go for the conquest of Black Ruthenia. Um, and that uh, consists essentially of the territories of Grodno, Brest, Nava, Rudak, right? And um, this was a necessity, as we will see, fundamentally to gain resources to oppose to the, the Teutonic Knights in the first place, right? Because if it had depended on the Lithuanians themselves, of course, they would have expanded in the Baltic. It, it was would have been much more you know convenient economically speaking that's the obvious direction but <laughs> the Teutons were there so in order to counter them accumulating resources they expanded in the, this weaker lands less productive lands but that nevertheless as we will see would fall gradually and by a greater extension under the the, the Lithuanian domin domination. Um, and in fact, Min Mindaugas was extending further this um, this this conquests, uh, and also in within the same Lithuania, taking out uh, rival chieftains, right, and uh, also obliging them to escape Lithuania to resettle um, in the east in the same Ruthenia, and that was also a way to partly reward them because, as you will see, the same Lithuanian boyars, so the the military aristocracy, like a bit the, the equivalent of the knights, right? They um, they they would be r paid with Rutanian lands in concession, right? So um, this was properly the the supply of of uh, Lithuanian m resources, right? F um, functional to 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 military power. This point was a. Uh, an important ruler in the area it was Daniel of Galicia. That is an interesting figure. He was leading campaigns also in Moldova, etc. You'll see it maybe on, on, on an occasion. And he tried in 1249, uh, 1250, um, let's say um, an expedition 
uh, to recover black ruthenia uh, aimed properly at um, coalizing um, an anti mindaugas coalition uh, in a, in a, also in an anti-pagan sense meaning that uh, you know mindaugas being the greater ruler in lithuania being pagan and you know the galicians were christians but many many people around were, were already christianized so um, that was a further you know way also to to internationally coordinate with i don't know with the with the germans with the you know with the crusaders and so on and this in fact coalition counted mindaugas lithuanian rivals um, that were jodvingians the samogitsians but also the livonian teutonic knights and however such coalition wasn't particularly solid as you can imagine because there were different realities mindaugas took advantage from their weakness in this regard and in fact he allied and this is important uh, himself with the same teutonic order at some point and not only that but he agreed to be baptized in fact uh, the event took place in 1251 also of relinquishing his claim over some lands in western lithuania right so in favor of you know the essentially the, teuton the teutonic expansion and in turn he would have received a, a, cr uh, a crown of lithuania so much that a kingdom of lithuania factually existed for for a while a, a christian one under Mindaugas himself. And this shows naturally how the process of Christianization was uh, somewhat, if not coveted in this specific, here we, we can't know what Mindaugas thought about religion, but in, in uh, I mean, his religion, because at that point they could, there was no thing like not no religion, but let's say that um, the, um, uh, you know, he would, quite pragmatically do that because that was a way to survive to consolidate power further with, with advantages that at that point were, were evident would derive from from it and in fact uh, thanks to this um, conversion properly Mindaugas managed to uh, fence off the attacks of coalition in 12 in the same 1251 and supported by the knights uh, the, the the crusaders he emerged as a victor to confirm his rule over Lithuania right uh, and this is interesting because it opened properly to the full process of uh, Christianization on many levels for example on July the 17 1251 Pope Innocent the fourth signed two papal bulls that ordered the Bishop of Celno to crown Mindaugas as king of Lithuania proper also appointing a bishop of for Lithuania and built a cathedral there that naturally were the basics of you know the you know ecclesiastical administration you establish a cathedral you know, a center of power with you know endowed with these with some lands uh, ecclesiastical administration backing the king etc in fact in 1253 Mindaugas was crowned uh, and thus uh, uh, the, we have the first and only time in Lithuanian history which there was something like a kingdom of Lithuania and uh, in the process, um, Indaugas was also granting, let's say, at least namely, parts of Jutvinge and Samogitsia that he factually did not control himself to the uh, Teutonic Knights in the years 1253 1259. It was just a way of saying, okay, get rid of those, you know, of, of those enemies of mine that are living there. And I allow you that in the perspective that I will become, that I am actually King of Lithuania. And um, also there was a peace signed um, with uh, Daniel of Galicia in, in 1254. These were orthodox, by the way, however. And that um, was also cemented by a marriage that involved Mindaugas' daughter and Daniel's son, Schwarn. Uh, and uh, also Mindaugas' nephew, Tautvilas, returned to his duchy of Polotsk, where he had been uh, settled in Samogitia, separated. Um, soon to be ruled by another nephew of Mindaugas that was uh, Trenyot. These are figures, as we'll see, had um, you know a, a, a role after you know with Mindaugas' departure and so on. Um, however, the Samogitians defeated the Teutonic Knights in 1260 at the Battle of Durbe, and at this point they turned to Mindaugas and they told him, "Look, you know we will accept you as king of Lithuania, but only if so we will be loyal to you." practice but because controlling 
here in a centralized fashion was very far from you know even the, the brightest you know hopes let's say but uh, you know the condition was however to uh, renounce to Christian religion uh, and Mindaugas accepted fundamentally he switched policy once again uh, he resumed warfare against the Teutonic Knights uh, he also resumed war against uh, I mean his conquest in Ruthenia we're, we don't know whether he apostatized, but that, in general, that makes you understand how volatile this religious, you know, and pragmatic these religious choices were, whatever they were. Um, and um, so, at this point, Lithuania was, we, we see it clearly, you know, essentially having these two directions. For the Northwest, they would fundamentally fence off the Teutonic, Knights attacks, and whereas for, for the southeast they, they would keep expanding in Ruthenia to gain further resources to oppose to their more perilous uh, enemies. Right, I mean, Daugas is considered historiographically like a bit the, the founder of the Lithuanian state, uh, which is, you know, a big word considering, you know, a foundation of a state of the modern No, it, it didn't, it wasn't like that. But it is important because, as we have seen, he basically rose in the international scene in a moment, managing to establish contacts essentially with the papacy, autonomously from the Holy Roman Emperors, and, um, and therefore, you know, acting, as we have seen also shrewdly, to ensure his, uh, you know, his, his uh, control on the land, and, and uh, however properly exploiting every every international tie he could, right, also switch inside and so on. And he was murdered in 1263 by Dalmantas of Pskov, and uh, that, uh, you know, that also was carrying out his own policies and growing independent from Novgorod, etc., and having this intervention in Spain. And um, Treniota as well. This is normal, right? You know, tribal societies are not very, let's say, nice with, with each other, generally speaking. Uh, every situation is good for, you know, killing somebody and, you know, taking their place. Um, and, in fact, uh, a, a freaking mess ensued, like a Lithuanian civil war. Uh, Treniota uh, also killed Taut Vilas, but he was killed in turn in 1264, so yeah, the, the saga continues. And um, the uh, the rule of Mindaugas' son, Baish Vilkas, followed. Um, uh, this, um, this Lithuanian duke is important because it was effectively the first one to become an Orthodox, not a Roman Christian. Um, and settle in Ruthenia, right? And this would essentially set a trend among Lithuanian uh, the ruling class for some, in some measures, I would say. Also, he was killed in 1267, um, and there was a further power struggle emerging between the aforementioned Svarna and uh, Traidenis, uh, and um, it, uh, it ended in a victory of the latter. Right, and Tardenis' reign that lasted surprisingly long compared to the one of his predecessor, 1269-1282, uh, brought some kind of uh, stability. The country was tired of uh, strife, etc., and so this was an important moment for recovery. And he uh, managed to, in this, because, you know, the, here, aside from, you see, Building a state is not just by imposing iron fists on everybody or killing them if they, they disobey, right? It's properly a, a broader process of coordination because the same elites at some point understand that they're stronger together, they have greater capacity, so even by giving a few and maintaining control of their own territories, they manage to confer greater, you know, formal, uh, nominal uh, power to, to, to the chosen rulers, right? Over, uh, overlords. In fact, Tardenis say, namely reunified all Lithuanian lands, right? He uh, pillaged uh, Ruthenia and Poland uh, successfully. Also, he managed to defeat the Teutonic Knights in Prussia and Livonia at the Battle of Aitz Kraukla in 1279, right? He became the ruler of Vyotvinja, Senegalia, and Eastern Prussia, um, which, which was a lot, right? And... Uh, Eventually, Poland 
you know, was to, to recognize this power and said because they observed that it could be instrumental to also the anti-Teutonic effort and that will start setting a trend, you know. One thing is having, you know, unruly tribes at your eastern border that just raid and you know that. But one other thing is seeing that this thing is becoming more, you know, something stronger, right? Uh, and in fact, there are the first, the, also the first Lithuanian Polish um, matrimonial union, one of Tredenis' daughter Gaudemunda and uh, Boleslav II of Mazovia. There was a Piast duke. At this point, Poland was all fragmented, still, mm, this dynasty of the Piast, so there were the various Dutch, Mazovia being one of the, the most powerful in Poland historically. Um, and, uh, this was a bit like in, in, in uh, Russia, where the, the Ruri kids had previously, you know, every principality said they descended from the same dynasty. Well, in Poland, this is much more, you know, true in the sense that it's really documentable. Um, but, say, it was still a, a fragmented reality. But also Poland was undergoing a gradual process of, you know, a recompaction of, of the monarch. And uh, Lithuania was still pagan. Right, and still, in this sense, coping with the renewed crusader struggles of the Teutonic Knights and the Livonian Horde. Um, in fact, uh, at this point, also another uh, threat was emerging uh, from the east, from, right, from the steppes, that were the Mongols of the Golden Horde that in 1241, 1259, and 1275 ravaged uh, uh, Lithuanian territory. The, the Mongols had, as you know, raided far and wide. They kind of invaded Poland thrice, uh, Hungary also. They, they arrived, fundamentally, they, they arrived at the gates of Germany. They even crossed the Alps into Italy. Some detached, I mean, they, they really pushed for it. And, and Lithuania, like these great Eastern uh, plains, uh, Eastern European plains, right, they, they were open to, there was no uh, major power would hold uh, the Mongol hordes. Naturally, forests um, and, uh, and swamps, etc., were not the top for Mongol cavalry. I realize we have to talk about the Mongols desperately at some point, understanding the broader process of their expansion, etc. And, you know, that the Golden Horde was established, this, you know, chunk of the, you know, successor state, let's call it in this way, the... Um, King Gizit rule, and that would effectively rule over the Russians. Over, yeah, the, you know, when you look at at this point, at what was happening in Russia, is that there were Mongol vassals. There's no way that there's no way that, that, that this is reflected at all levels, political culture, military culture. Um, this is radically overlooked. That is to say, a Russian army by this time was effectively like a, a Mongol army. That there was absolutely no difference. We made several videos explaining this in detail. We'll come back on it. And this was not just much because you know the the, the Russians had turned Mongols. This this is not the case. Of course, you know uh, things happened that you know blended at some some at some level these people. But that the the Slavic world, in this sense, had witnessed, especially the Eastern Europe, that this collapse of this the, the, uh, of the Kievan Rus that had somewhat given an order to the expansion of Russia, had prospered, etc. By the 13th century, already before the Mongol invasion, they had shown signs of uh, stagnation, of, of you know instability at least, um, and uh, as a result, uh, the especially the, the Mongol conquests had raised to the ground not literally entire cities, but also basically the destroyed the, the 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 middle classes right the trade of prosperity that you know uh, virtuous economical mer mercantile process that had also checked uh princely rule etc so russia had turned basically in an, an absolute uh mafia uh completely private and tartarized uh seigneurial reality and that set the base of what we see about feudalism up to 19th century Russia. It is to say, uh, the nobility is everything. Peasants are subhuman beings of no worth whatsoever. Uh, this is a reality that is actually was actually true in, historically in, in in many areas. Like Hungary, Poland was exactly the same thing. If you look up to the 19th century, like there is hardly any most disturbing reality of what was the 
the, the one of the, the, the countryside in this, in, this, in this country. I mean, um, we, we can't barely understand, because you see, Western Europe went through like a process of state building where still the middle classes kept prospering in an orderly structured system. They served, the, they, they participated through parliament. In these realities, in Eastern Europe, it was completely different. There had never been fundamentally a, a something like a true state, right? These were lands that had been barely feudalized, as you see here. And um, there was no counter, public counter factor to to the spread of a, of a non like of something that was just an un, 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 uh, you know scrupulous unprejudiced seigneurial rule right and it was ferocious because the mongols had provided this uh, example ideal and practice of seigneury at the most ruthlessly violent uh, levels that probably you know mankind has seen in in, in main, you know in most of its eras that that is, you know what the Mongols did, in fact, like, you know, look what happened to Baghdad, look what happened to, to the same, I mean, to, 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 to Russia in the first place. And this was a way to say, if you, you know, f for the local princes, if I imitate that model, that nobody can even think to, to, to stand up in front of me, I can become, you know, a great ruler in my own land, right, which was very different from the early kind of egalitarian tribal realities from which we're with a very, you know, with, with a, a consistent middle class that would try to check the rise of the greater, let's say, of, of the oligarchs by some degree, by the way, because this middle class is not like, you know, the modern bourgeoisie. They were basically just the, the local bosses that would say, okay, let's not make that guy over there rise too much power. That, that's the reality. So Lithuania, and this is not to be overlooked, actually proceeded along these patterns as well. They were, they, they were affected a lot by this idea of Mongol rule. Um, this is unlike other areas, like Poland, for example, in spite of the such influences, would turn this thing mostly later on, and partly also by Lithuanian influence when they, in the, in the modern age, Right, because otherwise, by the 15th century, Poland was pretty much like very similar, like in culture, in this some you know levels of you know subtle development to, to to the West. Right, it's a big war, uh, but um, still, like was, I mean, it was closer to to the West and to civilization broadly meant, like Bohemia, like this lands that were not dramatically advanced, but they they were surely framed within a more orderly political institutional rule, the developing, publicly speaking, in a more virtuous way, right? Um, forget about any of this in Eastern Europe, like by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and this, um, it's not a, a case that the, the, the Mongol conquest also opened an enormous opportunity for the Lithuanians themselves, right? As... Um, the Kievan Rus was uh, invaded by uh, the Golden Horde, like we were talking about 1237, 1240, right? From from there on, it, it's as if the entire structure collapsed and was brought under uh, the Golden Horde rule. Um, and other centers of power emerged, including Moscow. That was if, if Moscow emerged as the, the leader, like in Russia, it was because it was effectively the most loyal and faithful and obedient uh, Mongol vassal. Right, it's not that he wouldn't fight against them. At, you know, later on, Kulikov would prove. But it, it, if they had reached that point, it's because Moscow was one of the poorest of all. Of, of there's no comparison with Kiev, with Vladimir, with with also other of, of the cities we mentioned before. Um, and it would emerge exactly because of that, because the Mongols had chosen it, saying, "Okay, those are not that dangerous now. Let's let's boost them so to counter the power of these others." But it would emerge like all sceneries, right, in a fragmented reality. And uh, the Lithuanians took advantage of that, right? And took advantage by expanding wildly in these areas. Um, with danger, by the way, because as we've seen, the same Mongols were not uh, there sitting ducks, where they would launch raids periodically. It's just they couldn't settle in the, the northernmost part. Let's say when the steppe ended, the forest began, and, and that could see, you know, massacres things but no permanent settlement no capacity of building like um a more solid dominion like the see sarai the volga that's mostly where the 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 golden horde was but it was like open 
right? This is important to stress. There wouldn't be much politically in between um, that and the Baltic across Europe. Um, and um, when um, Tridenis died, uh, the German knights had uh, essentially completed their conquest of the Western Baltic tribes. They had gradually knocked them out one by one, right? Certain peoples, like the Prussians, had literally, you know, uh, they were they was they were cancelled from from history. If anything, you know, the name of the land remained Prussian. Eventually, take, given the name to the Prussians and all this on, but the, the pre-existing people didn't exist in an independent uh, reality uh, or identity anymore. Um, th this meant that so we're talking about the west of Lithuania, southwest of Lithuania. Um, and um, and so the the order would expand further on on, on against Lithuania, um, especially on Samojitsi. And the um, the uh, an important chances had ar arisen, especially af uh, in 1274, when the Great Prussian Rebellion had given the the Germans free hand, properly you know a motivation to raise everything to the ground. To exterminate everybody, uh, and um, they pressed on, right, to knock out other Baltic tribes, the Nadruvians, the uh, Sclavians, and in, in 1274 and 1277, and the largest ones and closest to Lithuania, the, the Jotvingians. And um, also, the Livonian order completed its conquest of Semigallia, the last Baltic ally of Lithuania, in 1291. So the country found itself isolated, if you want, from an international point of view, because they had rejected uh, basically any other alliance of the surrounding realities. Now, at this point, an important Lithuanian family was rising, the one that would give essentially life to the great native uh, Lithuanian dynasty to rule further, the family of the Jodiminas. Right and taking over the at this point you could call it Grand Duchy right resoundingly in 1285 under the rule of Jadis. Now Vitanis, uh, ruling between 1295 and 1315, and Jadiminas uh, between uh, 1315 and 1341, um, the latter giving name to the to the dynasty the Jadiminid, um, at this point were fully in invested in the clash against the Teutonic offense. V uh, Vitanis mm, was successful, right around 12 in, uh, 1298 uh, he, the, he managed to, 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 to defeat them and also to exploit even the internal rivalries um, within the Teutonic held lands, that is to say uh, especially with Riga, with the burghers of Riga, because uh, this uh, city uh, was uh, very important, uh, rich, you know, center in the area by the Baltic standards, uh, that also ha had joined the Ansa League, etc., the Anseatic League, and um, it wasn't happy at all of, let's say, of a, of a feudal rule from, from the, the Teutonic, so they began to wink at Lithuania and flirting, you know, back and forth like that. And this was particularly important because these cities were the major logistical centers also to serve uh, uh, the, uh, f the the routes of, of, of invasion. The Riga is in, on the Daugava River that we were, we were saying about before. So um, you couldn't really ignore such autonomistic movements and uh, the Lithuanians were clever to exploit them in, in anti-Teutonic uh, fashion. Um, at the same time, the the the, the Teutons could do the same thing in the Lithuanian lands because, um, for example, they had Samojitsia rebelling against the Lithuanian dukes in 1299-1300, right? And there were 20 incursions there uh, in the following 15 years. So consider even by this time, uh, that sees also a general, you know, recession in Europe, and you know specifically in Lithuania, but you know these weren't dramatically prosper area. What means to have like uh, twenty raids in in fifteen years, right? Uh, the the first one that go are the cultivations, the other agricultural resources. Many people exterminated, so l less labor force. 
feuds, uh, social collapse, rapes, enslavement, and all you can imagine. Um, so mm, consider that in all this, of course, the slave trade was a thing. Like Lithuanian society had, but probably the majority of people were free, namely, but you know there was slavery. Um, the the Tatars naturally conquering this this pagan tribes or you know, also sometimes somebody who was already Christianized sent them as slaves as well. So all this was based factually also on exploiting these resources in the local, you know, properly also human beings, right? And um, Jodominus fought against the Teutonic Knights as well, and he uh, kept cooperating with Riga. And in fact, in 1322-23, uh, took advantage of the conflict between the Knights of Archbishop Friedrich von Perstein of Riga. And uh, Geneminus also, however, at this point, sought for an expansion of Lithuanian international uh, connections. He cleverly entered in correspondence with, with the Papas, with John XXII. It was one of the, the most active, also kind of... You know, at this point, the papacy was carrying out a very extensive military policy in Italy. Was you know, was we were, it's basically all the the, the Vignones phase. So this was looking essentially at the French papal axis that was fighting against, effectively against the empire, against the Germans. Right, John the Twenty Second also did against Ludwig the the Bavarian, uh, etc. So there was a broader let's say, international uh, scheme, but, but, you know, based on effective, you know, alliances on this. Um, and however, it was far, right? And this would, however, grow this pagan state closer to Catholic, Roman Catholicism. And um, he uh, also invited German colonists to settle in Lithuania. This was also another very clever move. This was happening all over Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe, fundamentally, as we've seen Look at the Arrigas burgers, right? The, the Germany was expanding f towards the east in terms of, you know, well, Germany at this point had consistently risen in demographics, had even reached the Italian one at this point, um, and it was uh, exceeding uh, people, right? That locally couldn't quite live, so they, they would expand further, mostly in these eastern lands that would bring also all, um, uh, you know, some know how the Germans were. At this point, more of a kind of industries and than this mm, essentially rural realities in Eastern Europe. That there was uh, more more mercantile power, dynamism, craftsmen, etc. So this was very important because not just for a strictly economical point of view, but because as we've seen many times, inviting foreigners, let's say, it's always a good way to to limit the power of the local elites, right? Giving giving town charters to the east communities things like this so that you, they could be represented here here lithuania is a still a kind of rough reality where all this institutional system doesn't quite take off like that. it was a effectively a militarized uh, reality but still this were the preconditions to develop something greater uh, the same foreign policy at this point for example the lithuanian dukes had mongols in their bodyguards which is also another clever way of saying okay we don't trust anybody. We've seen before how they would assassinate each other all the time. It's better if I get a foreigner here and uh, we're handsomely paid. And um, this is a common practice. We've made a bit about the Vafidia, for example. The same Mamluks sometimes use this Mongol bodyguards and settlers, etc. Uh, around the same period. And um, yeah, and there was finally a, a peace. Uh, with uh, with the, the the Teutonic Order, uh, essentially achieved between 1324, 1327. This was an armed truce, basically, because of the Lithuanian appeals to the Papacy, saying the Teutonic Knights are attacking me. Could you please tell them to stop? And the Papacy said, you know what, well, you know, if you have an opportunity here to mediate with these people, to establish a church at some point to, to improve this problem, yeah, well, let's do that. And as we were saying before, the Papacy at that point was staunchly against uh, the Empire. Uh, so that was a, a good moment. Um, in fact, at this point, the Papal Legates were sent in, in Lithuania to, to check whether a conversion of the country could be carried out, but basically they they said no, because there were no further reasons at that point to 
uh, partly was a structural reason. From from the other, it was still probably paganism a gluing f factor against the uh, Teutonic Crusade uh, aggression. And the same Teutonic Knights, by the way, were against that. That is to say, if if Lithuania had Christianized, and that's why also the relations with the Papas were important. You know, they they could have not at that point legally attacked them. They would have been halted in this expansion towards the Baltic land. So uh, there was an interest, in a sense, uh, to and probably a lot of um, say division within the same Lithuanian policy on on what on, on Christianization policy. Because at this point it was, as we will see, growing essentially as an as a necessity on the longer run. I mean, the future was Christian naturally, and um, so. It's interesting to observe it like that. Um, in the 14th century, uh, Jademinas attempts to become baptized in 1323-24, also to establish Catholic Christianity um, in his country, were in fact opposed by the Samogitians. And also the, um, the Orthodox party, because um, uh, in the Lithuanian ducal court, the word naturally Orthodox Christians as well. Uh, that naturally would have seen the Catholic, uh, the, the Roman Christianization of of Lithuania as a big problem for you know having essentially this Catholic reality within that was as we will see now expanding also much from a territorial point of view expanding you know essentially c countering uh, the or orthodoxy right the Byzantine Empire at this point was quite weak as we've seen the Mongols had overrun Russia so it was not really a good moment for Orthodox Christianity and and this also has to be accounted altogether in papal policy um, so other very important uh, international connection of, of Lithuania with a Catholic power was in 1325 the marriage between uh, Judeminas daughter Aldona and the son of the Polish king Vladislav the um, the first that was Ka would be the, the future Casimir the third would make in fact um, the Lithuanian princess becoming queen of Poland later on uh, in 1333. So this uh, was a moment also of uh, recompaction of the Polish monarchy. So Poland was emerging as a, really a considerable power again in Central Europe and uh, also hostile to Teutonic expansion so the uh, Lithuanian marriage was very 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 important for for both countries um, and also to set some basis for dynastic connection by the way because this was like Poland had inherited basically that at this point was fundamentally falling within the Western practice of uh, a dynastic um, succession, hereditary, etc. Et in, in Lithuania, normally it would be the son of the duke as well that would succeed, but there was still kind of a broader sense of whether he, he would have been fit or not recognized by the broader uh, Lithuanian establishment. So it was, uh, this was also an attempt to properly stress the legitimacy of, uh, of the Judeminus dynasty as such right uh, alongside the western model that for for lithuanian for lithuania poland represented consistently and in fact also a defensive alliance with poland was concluded in the same 35 um, which naturally was mostly in an anti teutonic sense was uh, an approaching of lithuania mostly towards the uh, at least at this point towards uh, the, the the catholic uh, direction and uh, the Teutonic Knights were, at this point, kind of also losing momentum compared to the previous years. As we were saying, at the previous centuries, I mean, this was a broader uh, European problem that, you know, this major, if you look at all the major powers at this point, they they may expand for, for different reasons, but within internally, they are ever more kind of, in a sense, they are compact and in a, in a more... Uh, elitary sense, but uh, there is a, an economic crisis, there is a uh, demographic crisis, things are not going so well economically, now the Black Death will arrive uh, in 20 years, even if they didn't know it, 
yet at the time, but there were already famines, disasters, um, other illnesses, you know, already spraying. So um, it wasn't really, you know, the best of times in, in insight. Um, uh, the, 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 the Teutonic Knights, in this sense, tried to press on to probably ex by, in order, hoping to accelerate uh, a sudden collapse of Lithuania right before the ties with Poland would go, grow too strong. In fact, uh, they, they would yearly invade the country during, uh, thir uh, for, um, uh, during 1328 1340, which is also an important uh, offensive. Uh, the Lithuanians responded with raids into Prussia and Latvia, so war had resumed. Um, the uh, let's say the the, the reign of Judeminus uh, Judeminus as a Grand Duke of Lithuania marks uh, an important moment in the history of of the country because uh, in insight it's seen a bit as the the moment of 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 true compaction probably due to this um, process of elitization as we have seen in part also. Uh, because of the uh, resumed uh, struggle against uh, the, the Teutonics that made the, uh, the Lithuanians uh, stick together, as we've seen also seeking help from, from, uh, uh, from other countries. With the only exception of, the, of this realm essentially ruled by, by pagans, name, right? And it was also growing kind of military strong, mostly because of this expansion we'll see now in, in the south and developing as, uh, as a bit of a question mark in fact for whoever was saying what what are, what, what are these doing it for like this, is it going to fall within the the, the orthodox or the roman uh, christianity it, that could have changed really a lot right Li lithuanian uh, policy in this sense could really change a lot properly in European history and it did I mean with eventually with the connection with Poland but it could as we've seen before it could have gone uh, otherwise um, so because as we've seen of the collapse of the Kievan Rus Jeleminas had managed to expand further south and this is the great moment of, of, of objectively the construction of an enormous te uh, territorial domination um, by Lithuania Right, these weren't, as we've seen, particularly populated, or you know, there, there were a few communications that that that, um, that, 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 that this that was a crisis going on, etc. But but still, an impressive amount of land. But by evil standards, it's it, it, it's a lot, right? The 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 western Smolensk region, southern Polesia, even Kiev, as we were saying before, temporarily. So the former uh, seat of the the of the great of the great Rus. Uh, it's important to stress that the Russians had maintained, in spite of the collapse of Kiev, fundamentally the, the idea that the the Rus existed as such. Right? That's also why eventually Muscovy and the, the, the Tsars, etc., would maintain the title of uh, you know rulers of all Russias plural because because they were different Russias, very different ones that that still today are there, you know, the the, uh, um, the 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 Russian churches, which now from Kiev to Vladimir eventually would go to Russia, etc. So there was a great competition, properly maintaining the controls of the church. That was arguably the only thing that really kept Russia together at this point. That the uh, the older Rurik, uh, you know, fiction had, you know, also completely disappeared. That that the in the church had very important assets in, in the land. So conquering Kiev was also very symbolic for the Lithuanians because Russia had not really found a, a true center of power yet. In fact, the city was ruled uh, around 1330 by Jodemina's brother Fyodor. Um, also, um, the, uh, the Lithuanians went on with the conquest of Rutania, managing to, to, to eventually uh, encompass most of modern Belarus, Belarusian and Ukrainian territory, uh, essentially the Dnieper River basin that, as you know, opens also to the Black Sea, had this important connection further with the with the Orthodox, Orthodox world, and that's why also they thought of also signing with that one at some point. Um, and so, 
this enormous land that is very important in uh, in a also in a historical perspective it stretches from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The, the, these are this is the area that the the mo the modern theory of geopolitics that as you know I don't really like by definition as such, but you know was developed at some point you know defined up to ver you know up to this day you know this land specifically as some of the most strategically important in Europe not much because of as you've seen there local wealth that even at least not but the properly for this broader balance of powers that form like who is to occupy these lands and how to control them and this is a problem to, to this day right can mm, maintaining them can confer a critical mass power political and strategical mm, capacity given lots of other mm, say con preconditions that have nothing to do with geography in itself that's the point but still that that create a problem today that is say uh, like even today's Russian threat in a sense is conceived in this regard um, can the West kind of halt and you know before can Europe make it by itself uh, before the Americans arrive in the process that you know, of course we are very far from anything of like this to happen by any stretch of the imagination but still you know look at what happened in the Ukraine I mean it's part of this broader uh, necessity even of the balance of power in, in the area. Now, aside from this, um, the, um, let's say, this expansion towards the southeast, uh, as we were saying before, is the part of, part of the reason why Lithuania connected m more deeply with the Orthodox world. Uh, why? Because um, Lithuania, aside from this military uh, character itself, was less developed than Ruthenia. Ruthenia had seen uh, a greater as we've seen, socio-economical development, a greater political, cultural development, administrative one. So um, the Lithuanian state was now effectively being built on the basis of the contribution of the Ruthenian culture representatives, right? And the, the church, uh, the, the clerics, um, and, and also properly the land, as we've seen with all these strongholds, and, and the fact that uh, the Lithuanian boyars would be settled in them to... to to be the bulk of the Lithuanian military power. And the area was also quite unstable. This is not a firm compact domination over the area. There is the Golden Horde from the other side that actually claims um, you know, allegiance on these uh, communities as well. So there was actually a condominium that uh, um, the that even brought the Lithuanians to be obliged to actually to pay tribute to the Golden Horde in order to be there in the first place. Right, because um, they they wouldn't have the properly in the political strategical capacity to withstand like a, a major golden horde offensive in the moment. I don't know whether the, the the Teutonic Knights were pressing them so hard in the west. Right, so they were cautious, and they and this was a a prolifer like a penetration in a reality that was, however, under the orbit of some some other of this other great power, and that would essentially open to a coexistence and also great, um, as we were saying before, commixtion. Um, here we could digress, militarily speaking, but we'll make videos about these uh, realities, uh, say, military administrative, you know, military organization, tactics, and military culture, broad, broadly man. Um, also, as the, in, within the same Russia there were other autonomous powers such as Moscow as we were saying before that were in the same situation as vassals of the Mongols that were rising now to counter essentially the um, the uh, in fact the, the Lithuanian influence in the area uh, in fact um, Jadimina's state provided a counterbalance against the influence of Moscow uh, and enjoyed good relations with the principalities of Pskov, um, the old Novgorod, uh, and, 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 and the principality of Tver, right? Um, for um, for for many reasons, some of you know Novgorod was essentially the only truly Baltic power in a sense that uh, was enjoying you know the Baltic trade in the northern Europe, etc. These others were more territorial, truly hardcore Russian, say, uh, seigneurial realities that were trying to escape the pressure of of of, of the Muscovy. In fact, there were direct military confrontations with the same principality of Moscow under Ivan the First, 
around 1335. And um, around 1318, Gediminas' elder son, Algirdas, married Maria of Vitebsk, that was the daughter of Prince Yaroslav of Vitebsk, and settled in the city to rule the principality. So dynastic ties naturally could make the the various the, the these establishment you know installing in some some areas right and um Jeremina's, uh of Jeremina's seven sons four remained pagan while three converted to orthodox christianity and this shows how influent eastern christendom was at this point on Lithuania. and by practice, uh, Jeremias divided his domains among his the, the seven sons. Also, not really a great um, solution, right? You know, as we've seen many times in, in medieval Europe, but this was somewhat uh, required because otherwise, further struggle, even worse struggle, could uh, that then the, the frag this political fragmentation could could rise, as we've seen before as well. And, however, the county was so pressured by the Teutonic. Uh, offensive that the 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 brothers had to rule jointly right to maintain a unity of, of command and from um, 1345 Algirdas as we've seen the first born um, the, the the elder son took over as um, the Grand Duke of Lithuania uh, namely because in practice he ruled just over Lithuania and Ruthenia um, Whereas the, the Lithuanian lands proper were the domain of his equally able brother Kestutis. Now this is interesting because, because it shows you how far also southeast the, uh, the center of, of Lithuanian power had shifted. Basically it was not a Lithuanian power anymore, it was a Ruthenian one, while Lithuania would remain under Kestutis, as we've seen, but we, as we're seeing for me, we made a video about him in the seal uh, that presents his beautiful armor. And Algirdas, so the, the two brothers actually for, for a while shared the areas of, of action, right? Algirdas, naturally being on the uh, Ruthenian side, uh, fought mostly against the Mongols and the Principality of Moscow. While Kistutis in Lithuania naturally took on the, uh, you know, took upon himself the demanding struggle with the Teutonic Order. So I don't know which was worse, like, like a situation, but... Uh, this tells you also how precarious, in a sense, this whole, you know, systematization was. In fact, warfare with the Teutonic Knights continued from 1345 um, uh, onwards, and in 1348, uh, the Teutonic Knights defeated the Lithuanians at the Battle of Streva. At this point, Kestutis freaked out and requested King Casimir of Poland to mediate with the Pope, right, in hopes of finally converting Lithuanian, Lithuania to Christianity, right? But at this point, the Poles <laughs> quite, um, you know, you know, cleverly realized that Lithuania was weak and thought, well, not just not to help them in Christianization, but to invade their territories, taking from uh, Lithuania in 1349 the Alic area that as you know, is in the far is in the, the far south, right? Is towards the Black Sea, so um, also close to the Carpathians. So it was an area for which the Polish would have towards southeast, normally also with the struggle with the Ottomans in the century later would always aim at, right? Uh, because from there they could could enter directly into Poland as well, uh, and um, and also some Ruthenian lands further north, by the way. The more you grab, the better uh, it is. Um, so the Lithuanians, yeah, uh, you, you see here the the the, um, the trend is shifting, right? Lithuania is trying to is is becoming to 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 struggle hard, right? But the situation only improved from 1350 when Algirdas formed an alliance with the Principality of Tver, thinking this also, you know, they had asked the Polish to to help them finally convert them to Christianity because they were to be wiped out, right? And so at this point, the Poles, you know, replied the way they did. So they 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 they, they found that they needed to find uh, a rational ally. Um, Alic was uh, ceded by Lithuania uh, 
which wrote peace with Poland in 1352. Uh, so you you can't even wonder like how f what 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 was factually the grip that the, the Lithuanian establishment proper, I mean ethnic Lithuania, um, uh, had a, such a far away land south, right? But still, it was naturally the the evident picture of a you know a power that was permeable and that could be stripped land uh, territories from. So things kept, you know, this this uh, kept things a bit in balance. Uh, Algirdas and Clistudis, um looked f for, you know, extending their territories somewhere somewhere else, right? In fact, Bryansk was taken in 1359. In 1362, Algirdas captured Kiev again uh, after the scoring an important victory over the Mongols at the Battle of Blue Waters, right? Uh, also, Volhynia, Podolia, and the left bank Ukraine were were annexated. Um, the, the there was um, a, an incredible struggle from Kastudis against the Teutonic Knights for the um, for the for the survival of Lithuania. The knights were they were pouring now in with lots of other European mercenaries, and so it was actually a uh, you know, almost a basically heroic resistance, and the Saint Castus st st struck back, attacking the Teutonic possessions in Prussia multiple times. Um, however, the knights were, you know, making further progress and took Kaunas in 1362. And uh, problems with Poland followed again in 1366. Lithuania being obliged to give away part of Volhynia, including uh, Volodymyr, and was a peace with the Teutonic Knights also in 1367. So at this point, Lithuania was being eroded from the west and pre pressed further in, uh, in, in the east. In 1368, 1370, and 1372, Algirdas invaded the Grand Duchy of Muscovy. Uh, all the times they came pretty close to Moscow itself, right? That tells you also how, you know, powerful Lithuania was compared to these Russian principalities still. Um, and it would be an quote unquote eternal peace signed with the Treaty of Lu um, Lubutsk um, after the last attempt of taking the city. And, uh, and uh, this was necessary because they were very close from from taking Moscow as well but the the Teutonic Knights were really pressing damned hard Lithuania in 1373 1377 so all the resources now were had were to be invested there and they there was a rivalry also between the two brothers and their sons right uh, and uh, they, um, th this was negative for Lithuania because it, it would fragment it essentially against the Teutonic Knights and the Grand Duchy of Muscovy. Now that was now instead uh, regaining a lot of steam, especially after the great victory scored in 1380 over the Golden Horde at Kulikov. And in fact, the the Muscovites now were expanding fast all over Russia to be recognized properly as uh, rulers of all Rus lands and assuming also very important titles and powers connected to the church etc. So uh, Lithuania here you see a very fast expansion that uh, of in Ruthenia in the previous generations that however couldn't withstand now the, the reinforcement of, of surrounding powers and this is how it always happens. There is a vacuum everybody you know pours in or some, you know, who has the greatest available force pours in. But then things get stuffed because it's, it, it's overextends and there's really no firm rooting and um, it's easy to, to collapse and also to, at that point, having mismatched, let's say, the, the actual, um, you know, the, the, the properly having habituated to the amount of resources coming from, from those lands and uh, not having adequately reinforced uh, those lands that it would remain with when those were lost and therefore having fur problems right in a broader political and strategical perspective. So this situation was serious. Algirdas died in 1377, so his son Yogalia became Grand Duke while Kinsturis was still alive, his uncle. Um, the Teutonic pressure was at its peak, right? So 
um, the uh, Yogalia uh, was inclined to seize uh, defending Samogitia in order to concentrate on uh, per preserving the Rutanian Empire of Lithuania because they, they thought at this point that Rutania was more important than s certain parts of Lithuania itself to maintain their own power. Naturally, Yogalia was like the as we've seen, the power that ruled from Ruthenia itself. So naturally, Castutis would think otherwise, and his, his children as well. Um, so the this, as we were saying before, went at the detriment of Lithuanian unity. And the knights benefited. The, the Teutonic knights benefited from this. They managed to uh, to sign a separate armistice with with Castutis in thirteen seventy nine by the way. Um, and Yogalia also made uh, overtures to the Teutonic Order and concluded secretly the Treaty of uh, Dovi uh, de Schkes with them in 1380. Uh, that naturally was damaging Castuda's interests in the process. And in 1381, when Yogalia's forces were uh, occupied with the uh, repression of a rebellion in Polotsk, uh, Kastudis entered Vilnius, right, in order to remove his nephew from the throne. So this mm, started a, a Lithuan another Lithuanian civil war. Um, Kastudis kept in the meanwhile raiding against the Teutonic Order in 1382 so reinforcing this policy, uh, anti anti German policy and direction that had marked his his own life, and in in the meanwhile, uh, Yogalia managed to recover control of Vilnius. Well, his uncle was absent. Um, in fact, Kasudis was captured and died in Yogalia's custody, right. Uh, and Kastutis' son uh, uh, Vitautas escaped also because at that point uh, the big crack had happened. Now, Yogalia uh, agreed to the Treaty of Dubisa with the Teutonic Order um, uh, the, in 1382. This was a series of three legal acts actually, and then th that showed essentially Lithuanian weakness at that point. And there was a four year truce. Uh, that brought to Yogaila's conversion to Catholicism and the cession of half of Samogitia to the Teutonic Knights. In the meanwhile, Vitautas went to Prussia, so seeking support of the Teutonic Knights right, for his claims, uh, in including the one of the uh, Duchy of Trakai, right, that was a um, you know essentially uh, the the second most important center in Lithuania. Uh, almost becoming an institutionalized land, which he considered to have inherited from his father, legally, or more or less. So Yogaila uh, refused to the demands of his cousin, and this brought to a, a new invasion, a Teutonic invasion of Lithuania in 1383. Without us, however, um, having failed to, uh, in, to secure the entire duchy during the campaign, uh, established once again contact, uh, contacts with uh, Yogaila to, to find some a new arrangement and he um, received from him the areas of Grodno, Podlasi and Brest and abandoned the Teutonic order in 1384 by destroying the border strongholds entrusted to him by the same uh, knights um, so in 1384, the two Lithuanian dukes, acting together, managed to launch uh, a, 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 to, to wage a successful expedition against the lands ruled by the order once again. Um, so, at this point, however, the situation was desperate. Lithuania would go towards a process of Christianization, like the rest of Europe. Um, this would ensure fundamentally also the you know the, the you know preventing a, a, a further Teutonic uh, headway in, its, uh, in their own lands. 
uh, the you see the the Teutonic Order was aiming at the unification of the Prussian and Livonian branches by conquering Samogitia and all of Lithuania proper, right? And so uh, this uh, you know would uh, would naturally be that the, their own original goal ever since they had conquered the the Prussian and Latvian tribes back back in the day, and um, the, uh, the from there they could have expanded further as you understand also in the Slavic interland at some point uh, in Eastern Europe and they uh, they the the properly the interest of uh, the Teutonic interest in this is showed by the uh, astonishing amount of of military resources invested uh, in such o objective they launched 96 invasions of Lithuania between 1345 and 1382 right and at this point Li Lithuania simply couldn't make it anymore to respond they, they responded only with 42 raids on their own and that shows how you know now the balance of, of power was essentially switching in favor of the Teutonic Knights um, in relative terms so uh, also in the east as we've seen the Ruthenian lands were either rebelling or now threatened by the rise of Moscow right so um, they were far away lands right especially the ones on the outer sorry, you know, on the eastern southern border they were uh, easy to lose right and today we stop here about the uh, properly the, the, the story of it but if you know eventually what happened in the following years right with the 15th century etc you, you understand why the polish lithuanian commonwealth was born in the first place and, and together with the christianization of lithuania because at that point basically poland saved lithuania by 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 uniting its you know control of course they wouldn't manage to to direct it uh, to rule but uh, rule it but let's say it was at that point a given up of lithuanian independent capacity to 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 control to defend its own territory right if we were to look at the broader you know what what was lithuania at this point in history well lithuania proper didn't count more than 300,000 inhabitants itself but as we've seen had managed to to expand enormously on this maximum of 800,000 square kilometers in area right that are basically just uh, of which only the 10% 10, 10 comprised uh, ethnic Lithuania geographically and as we've seen uh, the, the 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 real process here is the for the gradual strengthening of the Kunigas chieftains powers with the the Giedraitis, the Olshansky, the Svirsky etc that would manage to catalyze to their own clientele their capacity to wage war and uh, you know share loot and settle in, in their clients in various lands this 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 order right in, in the counter that however remained also somewhat unavoidably separated there was no real central power that could really rule as we've seen in at this in, throughout this brief uh, explanation on even all the the regions of Lithuania that is not enormous from a territorial point of view so and it would some what have it more easily for at least in more in the closer lands in, in Ruthenia right then than Lithuania itself right because those were kind of more you know gentrified areas well Lithuania was uh, the, but were more resources well Lithuania was poor but it, it was more warlike at the same time so what properly was a less convenient investment in a sense as we've seen uh, under the dukes there was this broader nobility the the boyars right as you find uh, the same name also in Russia etc so that's uh, as we were saying before properly from a political and military point of view there is much properly of Eastern European uh, nature in, in this culture so, um, and the, uh, the, the for the rest the you know the, the majority of Lithuanians would live as farmers uh, workers um, and uh, there would be also a club, you know amount of certain amount of slave the the boyars ruled in their own territories like as in the in autonomous lords over these communities so that was developing unavoidably in a in a feudal sense let's say with less power the the, the free people and the one the greater of this individuals um and in fact um the 
formation of the Lithuanian boyars class was properly engineered, speeded up um, by the elite, by the yeah, I mean by the dukes through compensations of of land uh, payments, exemptions, etc. And th these were granted in measure also in which they were actually taken directly by these men, eventually recognized. Now, uh, as we've seen, the dukes couldn't quite do much uh, about it by a certain degree. As we've seen, this mostly happened in Ruthenia, right? It was a great uh, sort of far southeast, right, as a frontier area where, you know, there was new opportunity to uh, autonomously form some kind of scenery carrying power on, on its own. It was far away from properly the, as we've seen, the the, the, the core, the heart of Lithuanian uh, of the Lithuanian country and elite, so you could do technically also whatever you wanted in terms of, you know, killing or whatever. I mean, at least by a certain freer degree, considering that the lo depending on so the local allegiance, this is true. But factually, um, you can imagine the most ruthless practices in the process. And um, so, as we've seen, Ruthenia was Orthodox Christian. So, in the process, many Lithuanian, many from the Lithuanian establishment, converted to Orthodox Christianity. And in fact, the word Orthodox is proper in Lithuania proper from a geographical point of view. Um, and uh, there was uh, also a practice of marrying with these Russian princesses, um, and eventually also properly of converting in some in part, right? Because at that point, you know, paganism doesn't have a like you know, a structural equivalent to Christianity, right? It's a much simpler thing um, the, with no structure and things. So the, the, the Christianization is also a way to properly assert a, a degree of, legi of further legitimacy and even of nobility at that point, because as we've seen, Ruthenia was richer, so there was also a kind of uh, um, partially of uh, gentrification, maybe it's so much, but you know the enrichment also of these people. There, as we've seen, their their growth in importance over the, the rest of the freemen, etc. Had was to be sanctioned with some traits of of greater authority that that these more advanced lands presented in the form of Christianization and uh, all the shared benefits from a clientelly point of political point of view and so on. And as we were saying before, um, Rutania provided much of the human material for a further civil development of Lithuania. Like, uh, it was full of churches, monasteries, um, uh, monks were educated. They had a writing, right? Uh, they um, they also helped translating from Lithuanian. I mean, they they properly to to put it to write down things, and you know they had precious relics, there was uh, all the traffic eventually of assets, of properties that goes through the endowments, the, you know, the burial in the monasteries of this nobility, you know, all the very rewarding um, economical policy deriving from it. Um, and um, there the were Rutanians properly living in Lithuania, and it was a, a, a Rutanian quarter in Vilnius from the 14th century, and these were mostly, you know, Churchmen, merchants, etc., and um, they they had a, a script on their own, the church, the church Slavonic language, right? That also helped the developing in Chancery Slavonic for administration. Um, think think about the importance of, of keeping official re uh, records, right? The, the Lithuanians as tribesmen had never quite experienced this. They 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 got gradually to be cultivated, to be educated by this by these practices. And there are important documents such as the Lithuanian Metrica, that is a collection of essentially legal documents stemming from the 14th century, the Lithuanian Chronicles, uh, the statutes of uh, Lithuania that eventually were collected mostly in the 16th century, one was most important, but um, these were all written in, 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 uh, in Slavonic. Also there were other ethnic uh, presence in Lithuania, we've seen before the, the German settlers, but also the Jewish and the Armenian ones, right, they were invited to leave in Lithuania. The Jews were there ever since, especially the, the collapse of the Khazar Khaganate, you know, and they had common mass also in Poland, etc. Uh, there were, um, they contributed importantly to the development of Eastern uh, urban culture and uh, dynamizing trade, etc. 
and very very importantly very very much sought by the, the rulers that needed cities in to to counter the 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 overpower of the rural seigneuries that you know because this area has never seen basically urbanization before um true urbanization were mostly like hilltop forts things like that in lithuania and it had you know, mostly a military function, but not much of a further development. And naturally, yes, it, they had some economical importance, but just not properly in the, the, the full urban sense that was taking place in other areas of, of Europe. And um, we have seen that there were also Tartars, um, that and other, even also Turkic populations settled famously and historically in, in Lithuania, in Poland, uh, also for military reasons that were at the same time, as we were saying before, it was, uh, these were Muslims too, that they would be settled there to say, okay, um, they are um, yet another community that we will use to check the power of the nobility in a sense, also given their uh, more wild semi-nomadic lifestyle, they will kind of, you know, do as uh, to help the, the monarchy and to depend on it. They are also different religions. So they did the bond with the monarchy and it, its strengthening was obvious. This is obvious, I mean, in Paul, they did it in Poland. Look at Hungary with the Cumans, was the same exact thing. Um, before the Mongol invasion, there were lots of Turks also in Russia, as you know, the, the Russians called them the Svoy Pagania, that means uh, properly our pagans. That used to say those that had been there since, you know, the, the times of the, the Turks took over in the, in the steps and had uh, you know been hired and settled like mercenaries since that time so this was actually very very common and there were large communities of these people historically and lived living I mean, this went on for a long for for centuries right up to the modern age um and as we were saying before compared like to prussian or livonian uh, towns the lithuanian ones were less developed right outside of rutania the only say true cities let's call it like this were Vilnius that would be not surprisingly a Jediminas capital from 1323 and still one of Lithuania today and the old capital of Trakai as we've seen also Kaunas so these were the major centers that we were recalling before as the that recur because they they were in fact the most important would be you know an important areas from which to rule and for the sake of centralization you need a, a city of, of any kind uh, other old political centers were Kernave, Kreva, mm -hmm. and Vilnius was rising to prominence, especially in the 14th century, from a social, cultural, and economical point of view, being connected with Eastern Europe, the Baltic area. Um, as we've seen, there was an important connection properly between the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, and so on. Now, it passed through these routes, and uh, the Vilnius merchants had some privileges and exemptions for which they could travel all over the Lithuanian state to seize um, the new opportunities. I mean, of course, the Lithuanian conquests went in parallel with the confiscation of a lot of goods that would be handled by merchants, uh, by uh, Lithuanian merchants that could thus, you know, support uh, with their clientele the effort of the dukes and to finance them in the process and grow richer, right? And there were also Ruthenian, Polish, German merchants, the latter especially from Riga, as we were saying before. Many settled in Vilnius as well. As we've seen, they built masonry residences, which was a big deal for Lithuania at the time. The city had a governor, was, however, also ruled by, by the duke. There were three castles built there. So this reveals the importance, of course, of these centers for... Um, for the, the for rulers and there, there were mixed currencies in, in these areas because naturally the main markets were dominated by the Germans but as we've seen there were Lithuanian ones and also some influence from the East and uh, mostly uh, there was also a concentration of power among the as we've seen um, of properly of patrimonies from the side of the elites right this allowed in gradually to pass from the tribal elective kind of confe confederal profile to the ducal grand ducal is a better hereditary dynastic one right in a nutshell very gradually but this would happen and naturally the the territorial expansion helped as we were saying before 
There were councils, though, and this was normal, naturally, for any society of the time. They still had some, uh, you know, retained some political influence, but mostly they wouldn't, they wouldn't be like a parliament that could counter the, the rule of, of the duke. The, the problem was mostly, you know, there were other houses in the rest of Lithuania that couldn't be dislodged from, from there, and that you had to cope with them in much more concrete terms. Councils were here a, su a superstructural um political uh, institutional um, assembly wasn't quite developed at all and so th this is important because the state was huge so it makes you understand how private the, the nature of power was concretely there, there were uh, however some attempts of centralization through for example uh, some uh, you know, the administrative districts being established for designated officials to operate there, mostly in ju judicial and military matters, but, you know, their power depended on, on you know, uh, mostly on other factors rather than their, their appointment. And, um, yeah, so, so the, 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 the system grew feudal in nature, most. Right, Lithuanians spoke in a number of Augustite and, and some Ogician, these West Baltic languages. Uh, I don't know what we could say further that uh, surely paganism lived on, as we were saying, and they, even after the Chris Christianization, but it was part at that point like a kind of a national thing, right? They, they In the struggle, especially against the Crusaders, that that maintained a gluing factor that was you know, suited to the, still to, to the level of development of the country and in, in general terms. So, um, with all the orthodox intersections independently from it. And this, this an insight is fascinating because eventually, as we know, Lithuania fell in the, uh, you know, in the orbit of, of Poland. So, from, actually from the other side, from, from actually, however, the strongest part, the, the, the most consistent power that effectively existed in the area and also because of proximity etc and so these are roughly very roughly the 13th and 14th century lithuanian uh, highlights <laughs> let's say and we will keep talking about these also more in detail we'll surely talk about the 13th century is very important but also all the others will go gradually in detail to medieval history, um, uh, you know, hopefully with time. And for now, I uh, stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.